All right. So I think we will go ahead and and get started. So thank you all so much for taking time tonight to come and learn a little bit about how to follow the legislative session as we normally do in a normal session with the Oregon Legislative Information System, but also to learn a little bit about how the legislature is working this session and how you can best advocate for your issues and for yourself in the process. My name is Sarah Gelser and I'm the state senator here in Corvallis in Albany. And I very much miss seeing all of you in person. It's been close to a year since I've had an in-person town hall. That last event was the pedestrian safety uh, forum at Lincoln School related to um, a, a fatality, the, the death of a child in South Corvallis near the, near the co-op. And that uh, was a really well attended meeting. Some of you were there, um, but I, I just miss being able to be in person because it, you know, we feel a little bit more connected when, when we're all together. <clears throat> So uh, a couple of logistical pieces for those that signed in later, you'll see at the top, it says uh, two things that the forum is being recorded. It is because it will be repost reposted later to YouTube so that other people can access this information as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind because the little tiles are, are there. So your questions as you ask them uh, and what we see on the videos, those would be be recorded later. Obviously, your names would not be searchable, but your, your names are on the tiles. And I just want to make sure that's disclosed to everyone. And then where it says that it is on Zoom with Rev.com and live streaming, that is actually my captioning system. I've made a commitment that my forums will always be captioned when they're done online. So if you would like to use captions, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is just a closed caption button and you can poke that button and it will pull the pull those right up for you. <clears throat> the format for tonight, I'm going to walk through how to how to use the the system in a in a minute. Uh, we have tonight to help move through all of this. Uh, one of the members of my team, Katie Slobodnik. Katie, do you want to say hello? We go. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Katie Simonic. I am a legislative aide for Senator Gelser. And Katie tonight is playing the role of watching the chat box and watching for your hands. So she is going to uh, let me know and prompt me as people have questions. So since there are a number of people that are here, it's it's easiest if you put the question in the chat box or if you click the little. Oh wait, I'm on a different platform now. Do we raise our hands on this one or am I now totally into Teams? Yeah, just put your question in the chat box <laughs> and then Katie will, Katie will set us up. We are moving across so many electronic platforms right now that I get confused about the, about the features. So, um, so before we get started, does anybody have any questions before we launch into the, into the process here? And you are able to raise your hand through the um, reactions button. You'll see it at the bottom um, and there's a little raise hand button there. Yes. Also, they have all of these other buttons that I learned on a Zoom call the other night. Like I can put a little heart in my corner if I really like what you have to say. Or if you say something really shocking, I can show you how stunned I am. Uh, that must be why they don't let us have emojis during our hearings is we all listen to each other ask questions. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the share screen. I'm going to take you to see my screen right here. Oops, that's the wrong screen. That's you. All right. So to get to this, this system that's called the Oregon Legislative Information System, the easiest way to get there is to go to the legislative website, which is just oregonlegislature.gov. Now, before you ever even get to OLIS, this page really gives you a lot of information about what is happening at the Capitol on any given day. 
who you can find out who your legislator is by typing in your your address and they'll tell you who to write to. Uh, maybe you're talking to a friend that wants to write to their legislator. You can use this tool to help them do that. There are there's an FAQ here that is continuing to update the information about how to sign up to offer testimony during the remote session, how to get your testimony uploaded into the OLA system that we're going to look at in just a couple of minutes. There are a couple of other tools on this page that I really like to use. The first is that you can go over here to this events at the Capitol, which is just right here on the front of the legislative webpage. And you can see every, uh, every hearing that's taking place during the day and every event that is taking place in the Capitol. During a regular legislative session when we're actually in the building, this list will also include things like special presentations in the building, um, receptions, performances in the gallery, all of the things that typically take place in the Capitol building during a legislative session. As you've probably heard a lot, the building itself is not open. So that the building is not open to the public and it's really limited in how open it is to legislators and staff. For instance, uh, Katie came to meet me at the Capitol two weeks ago. It was one of only five times I've been in the Capitol since last March. Uh, it was the first time Katie and I got to meet in person. And the purpose of that meeting was to gather up materials and electronics for her to take home um, so that she can work from her remote location. Lena and Jax are also not working in the building. They are both working here in Corvallis from their remote locations. But when they needed to come up and get their materials, we needed to coordinate because we can't all be there at the same time and meet the social distancing requirements. So the reason for telling you all of that is that while the building isn't open to the public, it is not that the legislature is inside every day doing all of these things without the public. The only reason that we go into the building is to vote on the Senate floor or on the House floor. For the month of February in the Senate, we're only doing that once a week on Thursdays. So I'll go up tomorrow uh, at 11 o'clock. It will be a very short meeting just to first read bills. And I'll talk a little bit more about bill first readings. And as we get into March and April, the frequency of those meetings will increase. And our hope is that the metrics around the virus across the state of Oregon will also be decreasing at that time so that access might be able to increase a little bit. However, despite all of that, everything that is happening legislatively is open to to the public, primarily online, which is exactly the same way your legislator is accessing the session. And to give you a sense of what that looks like for a legislator, in a regular session, <clears throat> I get up early, I drive to the Capitol, I get there by 7 or 7.30, I start hearings around 8 and move from committee room to committee room and uh, meet with people in my office and in the Galleria and go to the floor for votes and go to more committee meetings and caucus meetings. In the remote session, I uh, walk into the room in which I have my computer and I sit down at this table and I have all of those same meetings, only I have them sitting right here in this spot. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is what the legislature looks like to me and it's working well. We've had some bumps along the way getting to know the format, um, but we are, are really starting to uh, better process people for public testimony and our um, IT team is working very hard to make the process more accessible to all of you. One of the things when you come to watch a hearing is that the, the it's really an algorithm. Some computer somewhere decides which sca squares you see on your screens. So we initially had had the expectation and and plan that all members would have their cameras on at all times. So that as the public was watching, you could one, hold us accountable that we were actually there. And two, so that it didn't feel like you were talking to just a series of blank screens and dots. There have been two issues that have come up with that, um, that I just really want to explain to people when they're watching. The first is that someone can be on and their calendar, can their calendar, their camera can be on, 
but their square is not being transmitted out to the public. So it's not that they're not there. It's not that their screen is not on. It's just that the algorithm has, has turned them off. That has been a concern for some members who really want people to know they are there and they are listening. <clears throat> the other challenge that we've had is that the Wi-Fi connection, as you probably know from doing more Zoom things, sometimes when it's weak, to be able to hear the audio, you need to turn off your video in order to preserve that bandwidth to hear things. I am personally having that trouble in my house. For some reason, Teams does not move very smoothly. So I am frequently turning off my video so that I'm not missing entire chunks of sentences of what people are offering in public testimony. The last thing that I want to mention about what you're seeing when you move in and then really we'll dive into this website is that I've, I've listened to people and I was watching a, a hearing at home and different members of my family came in and talked about how people weren't paying attention. People's cameras are in different places on their computers. So some people look like they're looking down the whole time. I usually have my um, my notes up on the laptop in front of me. And then up here is my big screen where I have the members of the committee. So when I'm watching directly the person, it looks like I'm, this is what it looks like. It looks like I'm looking someplace else. And that's different for everyone. We have one member whose camera is right at the bottom of his screen. So every time he talk, types, like we just see his typing fingers. We, uh, we call him uh, Mr. Spider Fingers now because we've all gotten to know his fingers so well. So I, I just share all of that to both ask for some, some grace and benefit of the doubt when you're looking at your legislators online. And secondly, to reassure you, everyone is, is really trying um, to be engaged in the technology also gets in the way and may make things look differently than they seem. So uh, any questions about that before moving into the next part? All right. So, and Katie, you'll you'll prompt me, right, if there is something in the chat because I can't see the chat with this open. Great. Um, so, uh, back to this main web page. Again, I had mentioned that before you go to Olis, there are tools here that are really helpful to use. One of those, and my favorite one that I use a couple of times a week, is if you go right here to where it says committees and you click on the committee buttons, you have you can see the today's meetings, which is one thing. You can see what's happening today. But I really like to use this agendas online. So if you click on the agendas online, it will show you every agenda that is currently posted, which goes out for a long time. I chair the Human Services, Mental Health, and Recovery Committee, and I have posted agendas out through February 11th. I like to keep them up about two weeks in advance so that people have plenty of time to, to prepare and, and be ready for the bill. What's really nice about this is that you can just, and I'm scrolling too fast for you to read, but what you'll see when you look at the agendas for each of these hearings, for instance, this is Senate Education, uh, so you can see each of the bills that is being heard for a public hearing. A public hearing is where you have the opportunity to offer testimony. You see these blue links here, so Senate Bill 222, just by looking at that, you can click on this button and it's going to take you to the bill page. I'll show you the bill page in a minute, but it makes it really easy to read what that bill is about. But you also get just a really brief summary about what the bill does. It's important to remember these are really brief summaries. So sometimes the bills do a whole lot more than that. And the description might be the smallest thing <laughs> that, the, that the bill does. So you, wanna, you want to dive in. The other thing that you'll see, there are public hearings there are also informational meetings. An informational meeting is when there's not a bill, but someone is coming to give you information. And we're at the time of the session where we have a lot of that. So in uh, education today, this presentation was an overview of the Teacher Standards and Practices Commission. What you can do when you're interested in a particular committee or that body of work, you can just follow these and look for when there are information hearings or, or public hearings that you are interested in. And you can either watch those live, which I'll show you how to do in a minute, or you can watch them on a recording later on. The last type of 
item that you'll see posted on a committee agenda is a work session. Work sessions are not open to public testimony. So you cannot sign up to, to speak at a work session. The work session is after we have completed the public hearings on the bill and the members start debating among themselves, voting on amendments, and ultimately voting on whether or not to send that, that bill out to the Senate for a vote of, of everybody in the chamber. The other thing that you'll see on every agenda, and you'll see these agendas show up in a, in a variety of formats, I'll show you that in a minute, but every agenda will show you exactly how to submit your written testimony or your oral testimony. Your links give you the chance to either testify by video or you can call in by phone. We can't see your face when you, when you do that, but we can certainly hear you. I would recommend having done this for the last couple of weeks, if you have concerns about the speed or the reliability of your internet, it might actually be better to call in so that we can all hear you. I, I know we had a situation in my committee yesterday that was really frustrating for the citizen that was trying to testify, but she kept freezing. So we really weren't getting her information. And chairs will be sure to tell you that. We're not going to let you just keep talking and nod our heads and say thank you if we did. We all really want to know what you have to say. So that is what you will see on these. The other thing that you'll see on here, every place there's a blue hyperlink that will take you where that goes. So for instance, if you click on this hyperlink to education, which is to the Senate Education Committee, it takes you directly into OLIS, uh, which is what I'm going to show you how to use. And it takes you to the committee page. The page for each committee will show you who the chair of the committee is, who the members of the committee are. The staff are the people that coordinate everything. So uh, the LPRO analysts are those nonpartisan staff that sit in the meetings with us. These are the people that give the overviews typically of a bill at the beginning of the session. They will kind of give that nonpartisan analysis. You can get their email address by clicking on their, their blue name and their direct phone number is there. Phone numbers are now set up to forward to wherever it is that people are at. So those phone numbers do, do definitely work. For the legislature, email is typically better just because we're conveying a lot of information. It's a little bit more accurate and you get people faster that way. And then to submit testimony, you simply, um, you can email it or you can put it through uh, um, through the web portal. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, the committee page will also show you when the committee meets. So this committee meets on Mondays and Wednesdays at 3.15. The hearings last for about an hour and 45 minutes. So this is a 3.15 to five o'clock hearing. On the right-hand side, you see where it lists just a series of dates. These are the dates that the committee has, has met or is planning to meet and has an agenda posted. So if we go back, for instance, to January 25th, which is the first day that we met, you'll be able to see um, you know, all the same information that we saw before. You can click on the agenda and see any revisions that have been there to the agenda. So we can't secretly take something off the agenda uh, and, and trick you. Uh, if you go across the top, uh, there's also a, a button for meeting materials. These are all of the materials that we have as committee members for that hearing. So you are seeing everything that we have. In this particular meeting, we adopted the rules. We had a um, presentation and I'll click to this from Colt Gill, who is the superintendent of public instruction. He gave us a PowerPoint uh, and you can uh, go back and you can go through you know, every page of this presentation that he gave to us. This was about um, school reopening and what that, what that process is. Oops. Um, Sarah. Yeah. We do have a question in the chat. Um, okay. It says, what does the other mean under the meeting time? So I guess there's an other button. Let me go back. Under the meeting time. 
Oh, the the regular meeting schedule, that is normally where the hearing room would be listed. And the hearing room is listed as other because nobody is in the hearing room. So it, in a regular session, you might see hearing room B or, uh, or A, <laughs> you know, wherever the hearing room is, but that is a, that is a really good, that's a really good question. The other thing that you can do is you can, if you have a committee that you really like a lot, you're very interested in them. If you see up here in this corner, there is an e-subscribe email. So you can click there, add your email address, and you will be emailed every time a new agenda is posted or changed. So you, you don't have to follow every day, you'll just get that information. And I'll show you in a minute, what's really convenient is that you can also do that for bills. So a lot of people have a bill or two or four that they care a lot about, either because they really wanna see it pass or they really, really don't wanna see it pass. And being able to get those emails really um, helps you stay as up to date as I am about what's happening. Sometimes we get calls from people and they have already gotten their alert and I haven't, so they know more than I do about, about what's happened at that time. And I, I just, I really recommend that tool, not for all the bills because you'll just get totally overwhelmed, but the ones that you really care about. The other thing that you can see in the committee section of OLIS is all of the bills that are assigned to that committee. When a bill is introduced, um, first there's a draft and then we, we take the bill or submit the bill as a legislative concept to the Secretary of the Senate or the Clerk of the House. It gets assigned a bill number and it's first read. That's what we are doing tomorrow on the Senate floor. It has to be read on the Senate floor for the first time before the Senate President or the Speaker of the House can assign the bill to a committee. So once the bill is assigned to a committee, that committee is responsible for the bill and that bill will stay in that committee until the committee takes action to make it go someplace else. Usually that go someplace else is because you've passed the bill out of the committee and you are sending it to the floor for a vote or sometimes you send it to the budget committee because it costs money and you have to see whether or not that would fit within a, a balanced budget. Uh, sometimes it's just really controversial and someone makes a really uh, powerful case or persuasive case, or they're just really persistent. Uh, and they say, please don't kill my bill today. Please let me have more time. And then you send it to a committee that's called rules. And I'll tell you a little bit more about rules in just a minute. And then in rare cases, uh, the bill will leave the committee because it's been misassigned. So we did that in my committee last week. We had a bill about child neglect, which I had requested because without reading the bill, I had assumed it was about child welfare. It was actually a judiciary bill. It was about a crime. So we made a motion to send the bill back to the Senate president so that he could send it to the committee. But once the bills are in the committee, it's, it's good to know you know what they what they have. This also gives you a sense of the workload of of the committee and what they are balancing to try to work through in terms of their public hearings. Um, as you can see, the education committee has a lot of bills in it. So when you are writing to a committee chair and asking them to schedule a bill, what they are looking at is how to balance when to have these hearings how long the hearings can be, and if there are bills that just aren't ready that you cannot have a hearing for. The reason for that is, as you saw, this committee, like all the policy committees in the Senate, only meets two times a week for an hour and 45 minutes. And any bill that is going to make it through the entire process has to be scheduled for a work session by the last week of March. The work session can be held into April, but it has to be identified as moving forward by the last week of March. So you really have to have gotten through your first set of, of hearings and it is um, kind of metaphysically impossible to have long hearings on all of these bills. And that's one of the reasons I think it's frustrating for people when there are time limits that are that are put on, on bills. And it's one of the reasons that written testimony is, is really effective. And I'll show you in a minute where that goes. Um, but 
it's it's just it's really hard to have hearings as long as we would like on most things. And it's one of the ironies. Some people argue that the short sessions that we have in the even years that are about six weeks long, that it rushes things too much. But in those sessions, we all have bill limits. In the Senate, you're only allowed to introduce one bill. So the irony is in the short session when we have less overall time, individual bills tend to get a lot more attention because the committees only have a handful of bills that are that are assigned to them. Um, and then you can see when you look at what they have, uh, what the type of meeting is, and again, I kind of explained those, the work session or the public hearing, you can see if it's scheduled to be heard coming up soon. So you can see when that these bills already have a spot on the calendar and then where they're at. At the end of the session, you can go back and look at a committee and see what happened to all of the bills that they had. And I'll just give you an example of that. I'll go back to the 2019 session and I'll go to my committee. So this is 2019. You can go all the way back to 2007 and all the materials are, are still in there. But if you were to go here to, and after in future sessions, Shamia Fagan is now our Secretary of State. So you can't email her anymore through the Senate and Senator Montes Anderson retired. So no more hyperlinks for them. But you can go through and see the bills that were assigned to our committee, how we did. Um, so where it's a chapter number assigned, that means that we passed the bill and it became law, the governor, the governor signed it. Bills that start with a joint memorial or a joint resolution, that gets called at the end, filed with the Secretary of State rather than a chapter number. Those are more like a letter to Congress or a joint statement of values that the legislature might vote on or uh, the memorials that we do for, for people to honor um, kind of leaders or very unique people within our, within our communities. Um, sometimes you'll see that the bill is in a Senate committee at the time that it died. This one here you'll see has a check mark. So that meant it never made it out of the Human Services Committee. Up here, you see it's in a Senate committee, but there is no check mark. So we probably sent that bill to rules at, at the end. Um, we did you know, fairly well with the bills that, that we had, but as you'll see, some of them didn't happen. You can also see as you go towards the end of the session, this is every hearing that we held in the committee that I chaired in, in 2019. This was a two day a week hearing. And when you go back and you want to know, for instance, what happened at the April 11th hearing, you can click into the onto the date. And again, you can see what the um, agenda was and who presented. You can see the meeting materials and those would be all the things that were presented to us on that day and if you go over on the right hand side again where this little arrow is if you click on the arrow this will take you to the video and you can see the hearing room we were in person then and um and it will take you through the hearing you can watch all of it. You can see what people said. You can see how people voted. It's it's really very useful. It usually takes a couple of hours after the hearing ends for it to show up like this on the website, but it is always it is always available kind of within that first day. Sometimes it can be a little glitchy, or sometimes it'll say that the video isn't available. It, it can, it's not available within the first hour, so it does, it does take a, a little bit of time. If you are interested in the hearing as it is taking place and you're not testifying, you can also uh, come to this place, and since there isn't a hearing happening right now, I can't show you this, but where this little arrow is, what you'll see instead is a little, um, video camera. And if you click that video camera, you can watch the hearing live. So right up until the time I opened this meeting, I was watching the House Committee on Conduct that is uh, meeting about the behavior of, uh, of a member. So that is how you access the, the, the kind of the committees and the information within the committees. Is there any question about that? 
Okay. So sometimes you know what committee you're looking for, but sometimes you're looking just for a specific bill. And for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to use the 2019 session just because the bill files are all full. And that is not the case yet for 2021 since we just started. But when you go to all this, if you want to go backwards in time, you want to you need to have chosen which session you are you are looking into. But again, you can go all the way back to 2007. Every year that you move up, more information is there. Really starting in 2015 is when you get a lot of information within, within the system. But once you're in the correct session, which this year would be the 2021 session, and you're looking for a bill, a particular bill, what's really easy is if you know the number of the bill. If you know that you are looking for um, Senate Bill 1, you can just go to Senate Bill 1 and click on it. And you get to see um, everything about the bill. So the, I'm going to come back and tell you about the bill numbers and what you can see about them. If you don't know what the bill number is, you can know who the bill sponsor is. Or maybe you want to check up on your legislator and see if she's actually doing any work or if uh, check up on the quality of the things that she's introducing. So you can go, you can find your legislator. And um, as legislators, we can either be chief sponsors of bills or regular sponsors of bills. Generally, when you're looking at a bill, the first chief sponsor is the, is the person that, that wrote the bill, that's doing the work on the bill. The sponsor, the regular sponsor, is usually someone else is doing the work, but they've invited you to sign on, or you, you like that bill so much that you don't just want to vote yes, you want your name on it. And that's sometimes true when there's a bill that's not likely to pass, but you want your chance to be there. This session, everyone has fewer sponsorships just because despite all this technology, we still have to sign these, they're called bill backs by hand where we affix our initials saying that we want to sponsor them and they all have to be on the same piece of paper. So there are some resolutions, for instance, that all 90 members of the legislature sign on to. Someone has to carry that same piece of paper around to all 90 people to put their initials on. Obviously that was not going to work uh, in this situation that we're in right now. So we have had to figure out how to email PDFs around to each other and add multiple signatures. Some people are better than that at others. I'm not one of the people in the category of the better at that. <laughs> I'm in the not better at that category. So keep that in mind when you're looking at, at 2021. Um, it's everybody has a little less, but you can click and you can see what the what the chief sponsor bills are. As you go down the bills, you can um, kind of read what the I can't see what I'm doing because the little hover thing is there. As you go down the bills, oh, ah, you can get the little summary of what the what the bill is about. So uh, this one was about Beaver baseball. We uh, did win a national championship. Um, this was about increasing fees for jurors and juror mileage reimbursement. Um, yeah, we uh, don't want to have kids under 18 engage in unlawfully controlled substances. So you can just kind of get a sense and you can get a sense about a member. Like you read about someone in the paper and you want to know more about, you know, what do they do? This is a really quick way, especially in their chief sponsor section, to just read through and see what are the things that they're interested in and what are the things that they're working on. And then if you keep going down, you get to the regular sponsorship list and, and you can also see what are the kinds of things that they that they agree to sign on to or that other people ask them to sign on to. And you can do that for all 90 members of the legislature. So if you don't know who the sponsor is and you're looking for a bill about something, but you don't know really what it is, you can go up here to build text. And this is really helpful for a couple of reasons. The first is that you can just search for any word in the bill and it will, it will bring it up. So um, canines, those are always good. No canines, maybe it was just dogs. 
There we go. We had a lot of bills about dogs. So you type in your, your keyword. And so you can see in, um, in 2019, we did talk a lot about dogs. Um, we gave, we talked about tax subtractions for adopting dogs and cats. Um, I have no idea what breweries had to do with dogs. I don't know if you had to have a dog there or not. It's the word anywhere in a bill, um, farm cafes, um, comfort animals and service animals, but you can just skim through. And if you know, you have heard, there is this bill about um, goats and you're really worried about anything related to goats and you've heard there's this terrible goat bill, you can just type in goat and start skimming as you go along here and see, oh, this must, this must be, this must be the one. Sometimes, you know, um, you've seen an LC number. People have talked about, here's this concept. That's a number it has before it's a, a bill. And a lot of times if you're in a work group, you'll see this before it goes in. And then you, you can just type in what that original number was and it will show you what, um, what bill that turned into. So I'm just gonna make up uh, LC 801 turned into House Bill 2173. Um, then you can also look by the bill title or the catch line measure summary, which again is kind of like that full text, but you're going to have to be more precise. If you go over into the advanced search, you can, um, and you're really good at searching, you can use that, that tool, but really the others should, should get you to where you, where you wanna be. And no, I can't get back to my, Ugh, why is that not? Sorry. No. Ah. All right, let me go back to this place. So, um, and the other way that you can use this sometimes is you have an idea at the end of the session, but there's no bill for it. You can look for a bill to amend by looking for a relating clause. So if you did care a lot about dogs, you would want something that was relating to dogs or relating to animals. And just to give you a sense of how those work and you're wondering what can, what can we do to a bill that you've read about, how much can we change it? If you care about cats, um, you could not put that into a bill that was relating to dogs if the title was relating to dogs. But if it was a bill about dogs, and the relating clause was relating to animals, you could change the dog bill to a cat bill or a horse bill or a goat bill um, or, or anything else. People like to, at the beginning of session, go through and look at what the relating clauses are. I got a number of notes because I have a bill whose relating to clause is relating to slayers. So some people just wanted to know, why do you have a bill relating to slayers? Some people wanted to know if it was about vampires and people named Buffy because there was apparently a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, apparently there's a singer called Beyonce who sometimes slays. So people wondered if that was it or was it about Santa Claus and modes of transportation, but it's actually about benefits after a death. So that is, anyway, that is how you search for the, for the bills. Are there questions about how to search for and find bills? No? All right, now is where it gets really interesting. So it, you can get to a bill and, um, oops, I'm just gonna go to a bill number. Actually, no, I'm gonna go to a, What's a, oh, you know which one is a good one is um, House Bill. I'm just trying to think of one that has a goodly amount of information in it. House Bill 2001. Uh, you all probably heard a lot about this bill in 2019. This was introduced by Speaker Kotek and this had to do with housing density and allowing multi-family units in neighborhoods that were currently zoned as single family dwellings. This generated a whole lot of, of email and concern. So you navigate to the page about the bill and what you'll see at the top, there's so much information here. It's, it's remarkable how much information there is. When you just first look at the page, you can easily see who the sponsors of the bill are. 
I mentioned to you before the bill title, which is the relating to clause, so relating to housing and declaring an emergency. An emergency clause simply means it's a it's an implementation date. It means that the bill goes into effect after the governor signs the signature immediately at that time. The catch line or summary explains a little bit about what it does, and you can get more information here than you can on those other sheets. It gives you a little bit more. These summaries are not written by the sponsors of the bill. These are written by kind of the nonpartisan analysts. Um, you can see the entire history of the bill. So you can see that this bill between January and April had public hearings on two different dates. It had work sessions on two different dates. You can go directly to each of these public hearings and you can, you can watch them uh, and see what happened at them. You can, at the work session, when there's a vote, you can always tell when a vote has happened because there's a little plus sign. And this will show you which amendments were adopted. And if you click it, you can read the amendments. You can see how every member voted on the bill that was on the committee. Um, this bill, as you can see here, it's due pass with amendments and be referred to ways and means. So this bill didn't go to the floor. It went to the budget committee. And then you can see it got assigned to the subcommittee. They also had a public hearing and a work session and then they held a work session in Ways and Means. And you can see there were three no votes, uh, Birchiger, Thompson, and Hansel, and all of these other I votes. Um, you can then see that it was sent to the floor. It had a second reading. So a second reading, they just basically say the bill came out of the committee, get ready. In a couple of days, we're gonna vote on it. And then the third reading is the final vote on the bill. And you can click here and you can see how every member of the House voted on the bill. And this bill is really interesting because here you'll see there are a number of no's, but not an overwhelming number of no's. It, it's a, a, a pretty strong passage, 43 to 16. This was a little different in the, in the Senate. So when a bill goes to Ways and Means, it doesn't go back for another policy hearing because the Ways and Means Committee is a joint committee. Uh, and then you can see on the last day of session, we had our, our vote. Um, the bill failed the first time. And then we reconsidered. I was actually excused for that first vote. Later the afternoon, in the afternoon, we returned and the bill passed. Um, and so this was the motion to reconsider. So 22 people said we can vote again. And then the bill passed with 17 votes. So it picked up a, a couple of extra votes, including mine. I was back for that, for that particular vote. Then you can see the speaker, president, governor signed, and it became, it became law. Now, if the bill was still ongoing, this is where you could look at your in to see, does it have a hearing or a work session coming up? Now, where it gets really exciting is up at the top where you have all of these all of these tabs. So if you were to click the text button, you can see what the bill looked like when it was first introduced. So at the very beginning, uh, Speaker Kotek was the only person that was that was signed on to this bill. But by the time it passed, all of these other people had signed on to the bill. We can all sign on to the bill as it as it moves along. And you can see that it it changed several times. When you're following a bill through the legislative session, you always wanna go with the highest letter. So the first bill is just you know House Bill 2001. Then after it gets amended, it's 2001A. If it gets amended again, it's 2001B. All of the prior forms don't matter anymore. So you wanna make sure if you're writing that you're looking at the current version of the bill. The analysis, section shows you all of the information that has been put together by the nonpartisan uh, offices. So the staff measure summaries are written by an office that's called the legislature, Legislative Policy and Research Office. These are nonpartisan policy analysts, basically. And they will typically just describe what the bill does. Um, just in great detail 
and without a lot of paragraph indentations. And they will give a brief summary of within all of those hearings, what did people talk about? What does the amendment do? And what's a little bit of background about that? So that's what you get in those measure summaries. The revenue impact is speaks to how much money does it not cost the state, but will it change the amount of tax revenue that is brought in? So for instance, if we, we saw that bill a minute ago that gave you a tax subtraction for adopting a cat or a dog from an animal shelter, that would have a revenue impact because it would decrease the revenue that, that came into the state. If it is a tax measure that is raising taxes, that revenue um, impact would say it, you know, it's going to increase um, tax revenues by X amount. Many have a, a no revenue impact or a minimal revenue impact, but our rules don't allow us to pass a bill out until it's had a revenue um, statement and a fiscal impact statement. The fiscal impact statement describes how much it will cost, not to everybody, but what it costs in state general fund. And it will mention in the budget reports what the impact is on um, individual local governments. And then a couple of years ago, we added a requirement to have an open government statement. Does this do anything that would make it harder for the people of Oregon to know how their government operates? Does this decrease access to records? Does it increase access to records? Does it open processes up to people more? Does it make government services more expensive? All of those things will, um, will be on there. And then they pull them all down here again. Um, the next part is amendments. These are all of the amendments that have been proposed or adopted. So people can propose amendments. And, and sometimes you do that when uh, you're trying to make a bill better and you end up voting against the bill, but you can point back to this amendment that you introduced, like this is what it would have taken me. And if we could have made this change, I would have been a yes. And then my favorite part, my favorite tab of all is the testimony or bill materials. Well, that's really weird. There's, hmm. That's very strange because usually there is, okay, they put it in this other tab for some reason, it's under staff analysis. But as you can see, as people come in and they offer testimony, just citizens, you can see what they have written and what they have said. So you as citizens, again, can see all of the information that the members of the committee are getting to consider as they decide how to vote on the bill. During the session, you can also see in some of the bills, and I'm gonna to go to one that's a little easier. This doesn't have as much in it. Um, let's see. Usually, they've just rearranged this. So you can go to the witness registration and you can see who signed up. This bill doesn't have a lot in it because it turned out we made an amendment and it didn't fit in the relating clause. So we had to put it all in a new bill. But typically if somebody comes and tells me that they weren't heard in a committee and it's coming to the second chamber, I like to go back and look at who signed in and who offered testimony. So I can see, were they opposed? Were they against? And I often go for more controversial measures to go and look to see if any of my constituents have, have showed up and, and um, participated in that in that way. And that's just the oral oral testimony, but I've always found that to be a really, a really helpful thing to do. It is important to remember that all of these things can be searched by Google. So especially in the human services committee that I chair, people sometimes share really personal information in their written testimony, not recognizing that that is then going to go on to live on the internet forever. So it's important to think about what you're putting in the written testimony. You are not required to put your address. You are not required to put your phone number. You do need to put your name. Um, but you do not have to disclose any personally identifying information besides your name. I would strongly suggest not submitting medical records and you really should never submit the personal information of someone that's not you. And again, that happens a lot in human services when people are trying to tell the story of, um, you know, something that a terrible thing that happened to their mom in a memory care facility or difficulty they had accessing services for um, their, their child when they were going through cancer treatment. So just, you always wanna keep those, you always wanna keep those things in mind. 
And then again, as I mentioned before at the, oops, wrong button. I'm gonna go back to 2021 now. In any of the bills, there is the same e-subscribe. So if you just click there, that is how you will get information about when the bill is scheduled for a work session or a floor session. Some bills, if you keep going down to the bottom, it will talk about floor letters. So you can see the things that are put on members' desks by other members right before we vote as, as well. Um, okay. Yeah. We do have um, one more question in the chat. Um, and this one says, in COVID mode, uh, will there be a sign-in um, as a means of showing interest in a bill? Thank you. That is a really excellent question. There has We have realized there has been some confusion about this. Last week, there was a hearing scheduled on reopening schools. It wasn't a bill. It was just to really have that conversation. As the chair called through people who had signed up to offer testimony, a lot of people weren't there. So we scheduled a second meeting to gather that testimony because we assumed people were having technical problems. And I think some people were having technical problems. It also turned out that a lot of people saw that sign in to offer testimony almost as a sign in to show your support or your opposition of, of this idea. When you're signing up to offer testimony, you're gonna be called by name to, uh, to, to talk. In terms of signing up to support a bill, that, that really would be offering testimony, sending, sending a, a letter or a note. If you um, go into the, uh, the committee, this one's on the Senate Committee on Healthcare, why can't I get in? You can email the, oh, because this already happened. So I've got to go to a future one, sorry. And today is over. Let's go to next week. So if you go here to this click, this click to submit public testimony, this will show you which committee you want to submit testimony on and you can click on which bill. So let's say, um, I, I don't know what any of these bills are, but <laughs> you would you would click on them. This is new to this session and you put your first name, last name, email address, your position, and then you can upload your testimony by text or by a, a PDF. That is for your written testimony. And if you don't wanna speak, you just want people to know that you're in support or opposition, you just, you just do it in that way. If you want to sign up to give oral testimony, you need to go and use this online form. I don't know why we don't have a hyperlink to that. So you just need to kind of click and save and, and go up to your, to your browser. And here, I'll go up and take us here. My little toolbox is at the top, so I can't quite see through where I'm, where I'm going. Um, I appear to have a live attendee at my <laughs> town hall that just walked in the room. So you'll see if you follow this link, it again gives you a chance just to fill out the fields that you have, including your telephone number. When you show up on the screen, uh, it will, this is how it will list you, your first and last name and your affiliation. If you leave that out, it's it's going to list you by your telephone number. And again, this will, uh, you identify which bill, and it's really important to be clear which bill number you want so you get called up for the right one. And there's two reasons why you, oh, I guess now it's asking you to say, you have to identify for all of the bills, yes or no. Sorry, there's a brand new system. And then, for the measure, the reason that it asks you before you submit the public testimony, before you get called, if you're for, against, or neutral, as chairs, we try to call people up and kind of alternate it a little bit so you don't have all the proponents first and all the opponents last, or you end up with more time for one side or the other. We really do try, try to balance it. If you come in a regular session and you're signing in on a sheet in the legislature, it will ask you if you've come from more than 100 miles away. And we will pretty much always 
put you up first because we know it will be very difficult for you to get back to the Capitol. Um, but if you are here from my district, you're not 100 miles away from the Capitol. So please don't check the box um, at the end. But you can always tell a chair or the committee administrator if you need to leave. So maybe you have a doctor's appointment or you're only available for a short period of time. Let them know that early by emailing that that committee assistant and um, let them know what your constraints are and they will try to help you. They can't always accommodate, but people really do try to be as accommodating as they can be. Finally, when you're done, it's really important to click the blue button at the bottom. The, otherwise you filled out the form and we won't get it and you won't get called. Um, we do have one more um, question in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure, did she go over it for you, David? Okay, perfect. All right, good. We're, we're all set. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> so I will go back. And, and that really is how you do the, the public testimony. The last piece that I would, so you've got this more button over here. And this is, you know, again, your committee agenda is online. You've seen these things before. You can go to each Senate member or House member and see which committees they serve on, or you can go by committee and see which members are on the committees. Uh, again, this new, oh, that's the other thing I was going to show you in a second. The new and updated measure list, you can, I'll come back to this in a minute, you can see what is being introduced. Reports and documents, there are a number of, um, of publications actually that, that take place. There is a first reading sheet that has all of the new bills that are being introduced. There are committee reports that kind of show the information you just saw in OLIS of what they talked about in the committee. It's that, it's that staff measure summary. Um, it's just another way to get to all of these other pieces. There also are potential conflicts of interest and in vote explanation documents. A lot of people don't know that these are, are in here. So you can look at, for instance, um, special session three, document type vote explanation. You can see that on House Bill 4402 that um, you know all of these members filed vote explanations. They explained why they why they voted the way that they that they did. People have a variety of reasons that they that they do that. Um, and sometimes it's a really helpful thing to do. Sometimes people do it when we don't have a lot of time to talk about a bill, just so that they can um, get on the record why they were for or against a measure. And that tends to happen more on the more controversial on the more controversial measures. Um, how do I get back to where I was? I've got too many things open here. Sorry. So if you go back to this here again, back to OLIS. So I've just gotten lost in my OLIS training. That's, I'm sorry, I'm sure that inspires a great deal of confidence. <laughs> but if you come back to the more, the other thing that you can look at down here is this legislative data that's available to the to the public. And this is, you know, anything that that we have that that you can access. This includes uh, reports that we get from from state agencies, um, the number of bills that have been passed, the number of Republican bills versus Democratic bills that have been heard. You can just really uh, kind of nerd out on on all of these on all of these things. So finally, if you go to OLIS and you just go directly into OLIS and you go to today, it will show you what's happening today in a different format than when I showed you before. So I'm going to show you for tomorrow. You can go down and you can see all of the committees that are meeting that day and at what time. You can get to that hearing by clicking on the blue hyperlink and you can get to the agendas and everything else. Um, you'll, you can see that there's no Senate third readings. The third readings again are always, what are we um, voting on? What is that final reading? The first readings are the, the bills that are going to be introduced and read for the first time. Now these are the bills that are going to be first read tomorrow. Their hyperlinks aren't turned on yet because they haven't been read. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, 
you'll be able to see what all these bills are. I, I think four of these are mine, except for those four, I have no idea what the others are and nobody else will until tomorrow. But that's the point where the Senate president can then um, assign them to, to committees. And you can always see what the publications are for a, a particular for a particular day. If you go to the top, you can see when the Senate or the House are scheduled. The House actually met yesterday. Right now, as I mentioned before, the Senate is only meeting one day a week. The House is meeting two days a week, and those will increase as as we move on. But if you go back to these days, for instance, you can see the House convened yesterday. And you can click to watch the live stream while it's happening. Or just like I showed you with the committees, you can uh, click and watch and um, go back and see what happened at that, at that floor session. The nice thing too is you can go to the recording log that's here for both the hearings and for the floor sessions. And you can click to the specific time stamps for what it is that you're interested in. So if what you really wanted to know about are, you know, the remonstrances, it doesn't look like they had any that day, you can go right there. The speaker made a number of announcements. So you click on that and it just takes you directly to that point in the video. If you wait a second to where, see it comes all the way to the end there, to where she's making her announcements. This becomes a lot more useful later in the session when you're trying to watch the floor debate on a particular measure. And that same tool is available within the committee videos as well. So you don't have to watch the entire two hour hearing to get to the 10 minutes that you're interested in. You can just you can just jump ahead. And I'm really grateful to the people that worked out how to do that. I My staff and I need to do that at the end of the day sometimes to figure out what happened on an issue or you'll hear that something happened with a bill and you want to go watch it for yourself. This makes it just vastly easier to be able to do that. And I think that is pretty much how you go through the uh, through the OLIS process. And I, I would just say there is a lot to find on the Oregon Legislative webpage. Um, you can learn about the building. You can, we've got virtual tours that are set up so you can tour the building from the computer in your family room. Um, you can find pictures, you can make public records requests. We've got glossaries. There's just, there's just a lot. And if you ever have questions about how to use these things, just send me an email or email my staff. We're always happy to try to help you access and use those things. So with that, I would turn it over to any questions. Yes, I'm looking at one in the chat right now. Um, what software do you use to provide video testimony for a hearing? Thank you. So right now, the platform that we're using is Microsoft Teams. And you don't have to have a Microsoft Teams program on your computer. You will get a link and you just kind of log in via the computer without having to download that. It's a little bit different than uh, than some of the other platforms. I don't love it. Um, I, I think Zoom is a lot easier to use, but apparently Teams is more secure. What else? And feel free to just pipe in too if there aren't a lot of questions in the chat. And also I would open it up if you have other questions. We have a few minutes left and you have questions about other things. I'm happy to answer those as well. Sarah, you may have already uh, mentioned this, but what about presentations? So what do you do like a screen share if, if one has a PowerPoint or that is a that is a really good question. So I have not yet done that, but I've watched it happen. I'm feeling nervous about when it's my turn. You provide the slideshow to the committee administrator ahead of time, and then they move through the slides for you. So it's a lot of next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. One of the challenges Thank that you. we've had is um, when the when there's 
kind of audio or visual material embedded within the materials that has worked sometimes and sometimes not. And, and the problem is we can generally see it, but it seems to be a little bit glitchy whether or not we can we can hear it, but I know they are they are working on that. But you can provide those materials. I would also suggest su submitting your slides as written testimony, kind of uploading it through that portal, because that also means it will be easy for people to access. I, I really like it that way myself, especially when the agencies give presentations, because I can go back and grab the numbers I'm looking for later without having to make sure I've heard people properly. Thank you. You're welcome. Sarah, can you explain what things are assigned to joint committees on things? And so, can you just explain what that means? Sure. So, um, as you know, the House has two chambers, or the House has the House has one chamber. They are a chamber. The legislature has two chambers: the House and the and the Senate. So, most committees are either a House committee or a Senate committee, and they do their work. And then, you know, just as part of the checks and balances, if it passes one chamber, it goes over to the other chamber, and they start the process all over again. The joint committees are committees that have both House members and Senate members on them. And so they only have to go through that joint committee. They don't have to go to individual committees in each chamber because they're both represented on the committee. The uh, most, the standing joint committee is the Joint Committee on Ways and Means, which is the budget committee. Not every state does it that way, but ultimately you have to agree on the budget anyway, so it makes more sense to, to put them together. And when they count the votes, it's not enough to just have a majority of the committee. You have to have a majority of the Senate part of the committee and a majority of the House part of, of the committee. So you still do have that, that check and balance. Sometimes when a bill goes to a joint committee, it can move a lot faster that way because it doesn't have to go through two different committees. A policy bill that, uh, that So we had a bill yesterday in my human services committee that um, provided financial assistance for, we call it double up food bucks for locally grown fruits and vegetables from farmers market through your SNAP benefits. Really great bill, really fun, a lot of public testimony, but that bill is going to cost $4 million. So that will leave the Senate human services committee and go to the joint committee on ways and means where it will sit until May or June, and then they will decide whether or not they have $4 million, and it will go to the Senate floor first, but after that it does not have to go to the House Human Services Committee because there were already House members on the Joint Ways and Means Committee. Does that answer your question, Denise? Great. Uh, we have one more question in the chat. Um, so what formats are used if you submit slides for your live testimony? That is a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I think obviously PowerPoint works. I have had trouble. I use a Mac and I use pages. I've tended to convert those to a PDF and have had them scroll up for me because that's not always been consistent. In the past, when we've been in the building, you, you can just plug your own computer in and manage that yourself. So I'll, I'll find that out and put it in my next newsletter if there are limitations. And if you ever have a question about that too, for any particular committee, again, go to that committee page and contact that the policy analyst for that. We call them the L pro, the L pro for that committee, and they'll be able to answer that for you. I think the one other thing I would mention about Olis that I didn't show you is that within, within Olis, I can sign in as, a, I'll put this back on my screen so I can show you. So if I bring myself back to Olis, I can come up here, log myself in. And when I go within a bill, and I haven't put any notes in yet, but when I'm logged in as a, as a member, I get an extra tab here, which is my uploads. And I have a place where I can, I can upload documents. So if someone brings me a document, a constituent, I can put it in there. If I receive 
telephone calls about the the bill i can kind of come to this screen that's being very slow to load and um, type these notes for myself into them sometimes you'll see members uh, typing when they're in the in the committee let me get back to that bill it kind of froze up there i think i'm now having a computer problem here my computer is not happy with me it's freezing, but you can see if I like click on this comments, when I'm in a hearing, I often have that tab open and I will take notes about what people are saying or questions that I have for later. And those comments and documents are only visible to me. Those are those are the things that, that I'm using or, or notes to myself. Uh, some members have figured out how to use the PDF of the bill to kind of scribble on the bill. I have not I'm not technologically savvy, so I can't do that. But that's what happens when you send me an email about a bill, even if it's a bill that, especially if it's a bill that is not in one of the committees that I'm on, your email gets appended into my bill file until we fall behind. But, but theoretically, it's there. So when we go to the floor to vote, part of my preparation for that floor vote that day is I go through the bills and I look to the comments and documents and see, oh, you know, uh, Phyllis wrote to me about this bill and she was really concerned about, you know, this particular issue. And sometimes I make notes for myself because I'll promise someone that I'll put something on the record when that bill is there, or it's, you know, a good bill for most places, but it's a problem for my district and I can, I can make those notes for myself. And that's why your communication is really important. When you, when you write, especially when you write your personal letters instead of the form emails, it makes a, a really, a really big difference. I read all the email that comes in. I try to respond to the ones that are individually written. That has gotten harder every session just because the volume of that is, is just enormous. Katie is just really doing a great job with constituent work and she's going to take on just diving into that so that people don't have to wait for me. With the form letters, um, the first couple sessions, I felt like I needed to write an individual reply to every single one. And there could be hundreds on an individual bill and that wasn't sustainable. So now we collect the form letters for a particular topic and we kind of respond at the end of the week. And um, I will write the response, but I will send the same response to the same letter to all 50 people that send me the same, the same letter. Uh, and then on some things that are controversial, for instance, one of the very controversial bills this session will be about uh, non-medical exemptions to vaccines. And that was a very controversial bill last session. There is an enormous amount of email about it. I just wrote one reply that is going to both the people that are in favor and opposed. I have a position on the bill. I explain what it is. And, um, and, and that's just the way that we're handling that one. Anything else, any other questions? All right. Well, I thank you all very much for taking time to come and do this. And I just wanna close again with, it is really important to hear from you uh, via email, especially that is always the best way to get a hold of us. The phones, especially remotely are a little difficult. So. Um, we have a, a mobile phone that is currently living with Katie that the capital phone forwards to. So sometimes there's also a, a delay in, in accessing the email because she'll call in a couple times a day to check on the email. But it also means during the session where we're all in the office and there's multiple phones and we can have multiple lines ring at the same time, it's just being forwarded to, to one phone. So the phone is a really difficult tool this time because of the remote nature. Email, email is just really helpful. It also helps me get back to you more individually than phone calls. It's really hard to make time for the phone calls, but at the end of the day, I know Katie um, kind of puts a memo to me at the end of the day with everybody that she's talked to and she helpfully puts a hyperlink in there. So I'm able to immediately answer your question and get that to you at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So um, that's helpful. And if you do call and leave a voicemail, please leave your email address and uh, leave it twice <laughs> so that we can make sure that we, that we get it. And, uh, and then finally, the committees definitely offer your, your testimony at the committees. It does make a, it does make a difference. All right. Thank you all so much for, for joining tonight and we will see you next time. I hope. Thank you. Good night.
Good Thanks night. Thanks so much, Senator Gelser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.